Hello, and welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session is How Faint Can You Go? And it's going to be presented by Basil Rowe. But as always, before we jump into that, I'm going to share my screen and show off our image of the week. Um, and this week's image of the week goes to Nicholas Kazillion uh, for his bubble nebula region. Um, Pretty cool shot, narrow band image, um, wide, wide field. Um, I did not, uh, I'm guessing that this is a single exposure, or excuse me, a single uh, frame and not a mosaic, but I am not seeing uh, the details of it in here. I don't know if I forgot to put it in, but either way, it's a, it's a great shot. Um, congrats, Nicholas. You guys can go onto our website, check it out, comment on it, or submit your images for image of the week and uh, you'll be up in consideration. Uh, what else do I want to say? Um, uh, our, if you are watching us on YouTube, you may be best, if you're watching us live on YouTube, you may be best to go onto our website, theastroimagingchannel.com, and we have a chat box because we do not monitor the YouTube chat. Uh, we have our own chat, and uh, it's fairly feature-rich. I think you'll like it. Uh, but that's how you uh, take part in these conversations if you have questions on the presentation. Um, as well, the presentation is posted on the YouTube site. Uh, there's a link in the bottom of the YouTube, so if you have to toggle back and forth, you can get it. Or if you want to refer to any particular slide, it's there. Um, and uh, I guess the other thing, oh, the only other thing I have is uh, I know there is one person waiting for a T-shirt, and the T-shirts are on their way to me. Uh, so if anyone else wants a t-shirt, now's a great time to order it. Just specify your address and uh, your the size of the t-shirt you would like. And uh, you get them on our website, theastroimagingchannel.com, and click support, and you can support us. That's how we pay for our expenses. That's all I got, so what I'm going to do is hand it right over to Basil, who is right here in the room. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Let me uh, share my screen. And go here. And okay, does that look correct? We see it. Yep, looks right. Awesome. Well, again, thank you very much for inviting me here uh, to talk. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity. So, what I wanted to talk about uh, is, you know, how faint can you go with your system, uh, your gear uh, at your location, and you know, kind of combined with that is, you know, getting a handle on the correct exposure time for things. Um, and, you know, this this presentation is, I guess, kind of more of a workshop um, than a talk. Um, so I got a lot of stuff here I want to try and go through quickly. I, I uh, Like Adam said, the uh, presentation is, is uh, available online from YouTube. And... I did a couple of walkthrough screencasts of some of the details of this. So um, hopefully what you don't get from this, you can find there if you want to pursue this. So the nature of the question, um, you know, how faint can you go? Perhaps a better question would be how faint can you go for a given signal to noise ratio? Um, that's probably a more valid question uh, for astronomers. And you know, signal to noise ratio is is really a key in so many things that astronomers do, on uh, astrophotographers. Uh, I kind of like to think of it as, you know, a measure of contrast. Uh, how easy is it to see something or image something, or how difficult is it? Um, and you know, to get a to get an exact answer to that question, how faint can you go? There's just too many variables. You, you really can't pin it down to an exact number. Uh, so hopefully this is just a kind of a get you in the ballpark, a uh, good ballpark kind of way of doing it. Uh, you know, I tried messing around with some exposure time calculators, and I, I found that they were uh, a little difficult to use, at least most of the ones that I found, and, and I couldn't really get them to work well for my situation. Uh, so I kind of came up with this method, um, and it's it technically... It's valid only for point sources, but I believe it can be useful for extended objects. Um, maybe we can discuss that a little afterwards. 
So kind of a roadmap of where we're going, just some expectations for you if you want to try this. And then a lot of the workflow of how I went about putting these charts together, um, you know, preparation you got to do before, some data acquisition, taking the images. Uh, then we're going to talk a little photometry. And we're going to talk a little bit of spreadsheet stuff. Um, and I hope um, I hope that's OK. Uh, and then some final thoughts. So a quick word about signal-to-noise ratio. I, I refer you to uh, a program on the Astro Imaging channel uh, on November 23rd of 2014, uh, where Adam and um, Adam presented a really good summary of this. So if you want to get all the nitty-gritty about signal-to-noise ratio, um, I, I would say start there. Uh, some general rules of thumb. When, when you're talking signal-to-noise ratios of two to three, uh, you're, you're talking about something that's barely there, uh, just barely above the noise. Uh, it's when you get to around five that you can be pretty confident you're seeing something. Uh, when you get to 10, uh, you can actually start doing some measurements, particularly photometry. Uh, and when you get to 100, then uh, the quality of your measurements uh, goes up quite a bit, and you can start talking about doing things like exoplanet transits, uh, really high precision photometry. Uh, so if you decide to try this, um, most of your time is going to be spent in Excel or the open source equivalent, uh, LibreOffice. I really like LibreOffice of all the open source variants of spreadsheet programs out there. Uh, I think it, it does a lot more, especially in the spreadsheet program. Uh, next, you're going to spend the most amount of time next in, in uh, doing photometry. And the least amount will be taking images. Uh, and you will need to be comfortable creating graphs and trend lines in Excel. Uh, and I kind of walked through that process in some of the screencasts. Uh, and you will need to be comfortable doing some basic photometry. Things like choosing aperture sizes, uh, converting from instrumental magnitudes to standard magnitudes, this uh, magnitude zero term, which we're going to talk about. Um, so my motivations, well, it's really driven by my astrometry I do of asteroids. Uh, I needed to be more efficient with my data acquisition. Uh, I found that I was spending too much time imaging the bright stuff and not necessarily enough time imaging the faint stuff. Uh, so I, I was clearly wasting a lot of time uh, at the telescope. And I really wanted to get better. Uh, and I just wanted a simple way to get a good estimate of exposure times and also the capabilities uh, of my equipment from my fairly light polluted location. Um, and I was thinking some other areas where this this would be helpful, really anything involving light curve analysis, uh, variable star work, asteroid light curves, exoplanet studies, nova, supernova light curves, uh, deep sky imaging, question mark, extended objects, uh, and also comparing equipment or imaging locations. So, you know, you could test this from your backyard, do this in your backyard, and do it from your dark sky, and really get a, a measure of how much better the dark sky is from your backyard. Uh, so a quick overview of the process. Um, you start by taking a series of images of a blank, quote unquote, star field near the zenith. Say, for example, uh, 30 10 second uh, exposures for a total of 300 seconds. And I'm going to be using that example a lot throughout this. So you start with a series of subs. Uh, and you calibrate the images, and then you stack them to create a set of images to measure. Say you stack three of the 10 second images to create one of 30 second total time, stack six of them for a total of 60 seconds total time, uh, stack nine of them for a total of 90 seconds total time, all the way up uh, to a total of 300 seconds, just for example. And you do some photometry on all those stacked images, and you create a table of magnitudes, 
and signal to noise ratios for all the stars uh, or most of the stars in that field of view, a good number of stars at least. Uh, and then you start working on creating graphs of first magnitude versus signal to noise ratio, each of the stacked images. Then you plot a trend line uh, through that graph. Uh, and you use the formula for that trend line to create another graph of magnitude versus exposure time uh, for a given signal to noise ratio. And I'm going to kind of hopefully walk you through that a little bit. That's basically the process. Um, so I'm going to jump right to the end here. Uh, this is uh, and hopefully I don't lose you right now. Uh, just kind of ignore the equations and all the stuff on here. But what, uh, what I've got here is, is a graph of exposure time along the bottom in seconds up to 300. And then over here is magnitude, 17, 18, 19. And then these lines represent different signal to noise ratios. Uh, so the way I would read this is uh, for, say, a, a, a 100 second exposure with my stuff from my backyard, uh, if I wanted, you know, a, a star of about, you know, 18 magnitude, 18.1, uh, is going to give me a signal to noise ratio of about 10. Uh, if I want to go a little bit fainter uh, to a signal to noise ratio of, uh, say, 5, then I can get all the way down to around 19th magnitude. Okay, so that's, and again, this is based on a 10 second uh, sub exposure. And how we get to this graph, I'll, I'll show you. But this is kind of where we're headed uh, is to produce a graph like this for your stuff, for your equipment uh, from your backyard. Um, something to note here are these correlation coefficients, these R squareds, 0 0.99, 0 0.9. That means that the data fit this line. Uh, or the line fits the data very well. Uh, it's good to see a correlation uh, coefficient like that. These are logarithmic plots. So that's where we're going. Uh, and then this is kind of really where we're going. Um, if you uh, use, if you do various series of exposures uh, and combine all the plots for a signal to noise ratio of five, uh, you can get a graph like this. And what this is showing, I did uh, a bunch of subs at 2 seconds, 5 seconds, 10, 20, up to 60 seconds. And those are the lines you see here. This is all, again, for just a SNR 5. Uh, here's, again, exposure time and magnitude. Um, so this is this is what I use when I want to figure out what kind of exposure time do I want to go for. I basically have several of these plots, signal to SNR 5, and I have one SNR 7 and 10. Uh, and I kind of pick what SNR I want to shoot for, and then I figure an exposure time. So this is uh, like the last couple of slides of the presentation, but I, I think I felt it would be better to show you this to start with. Um, just to kind of show you where we're going. And I, I guess before I go any further, are there any questions that have popped up yet? Um, <clears throat> Alex is just asking, does your estimate change from night to night? Um, it can, sure. Uh, and one of the things I, I mentioned is when you do this, when you do your data collection, uh, try and pick the best night you've got. You, uh, good transparency. Uh, no moon in the sky. You just you kind of have to pick the best night or one of the best nights. And you know if you want to go through this process on a, on a night when the moon's in the sky, you can do that. Uh, but for for my purposes, I check I just pick the best night uh, to give me an idea. Well, if I want to you know use this exposure time, I I got to go at least this long, and I can adjust it longer depending on the conditions tonight. Cool. So, so, go ahead. Basil, that, that means that while you've done all this work to find out what your 
ideal exposure time for getting down to that particular magnitude is on one night. On the next night, it may have changed. Oh, yes. And how useful is this then? You know what I mean? Um, that's a good question. Um, and I find it useful for what I'm doing. Um, I found it has uh, helped me a lot get the right exposure time for the stuff that I'm doing. Uh, what do, how would you characterize the stuff you're doing? What, are you doing scientific work, pretty picture work? What are you doing? Um, mostly right now it's, it's astrometry of asteroids. Uh, and so I'm trying to figure out, okay, there's this 19th magnitude asteroid. Um, you know, how long of an exposure do I need to go to tonight to get it? Okay. So you're, you're trying to figure out if you've got a 19th magnitude, uh, then you know you're going to have to have a four minute and a half exposure at least. At least. On a good night. And so you might go, okay, I'll, it's, it is a poopy night, so let's go with the six or an eight or something like that. Minute something, exposure. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so again, this is the end. Hopefully, you know, I'll give you a better idea of how, you know, how I got here. Um, so a little bit of the, about the workflow and, and preparation before you do anything. You need to kind of determine, this is what I did. Uh, I need to determine a maximum total exposure time that you're going to use. Uh, mine was 300 seconds. I realize that's ridiculously short to some of the astro imagers uh, out there. Uh, but at least to get the data plotted, um, that was sufficient for my purposes. And you'll see later when, when we extend some of the trend lines out what I'm talking about. Uh, and then I needed to kind of determine the typical sub-exposure times that I use. Mine were, you know, two to 60 seconds. Uh, I have to do two-second exposure sometimes for some of these near-Earth asteroids uh, that are moving very quickly. Uh, if I go any longer than that, they're going to appear as trail. Um, you need to determine your CCD's gain. Um, and you need to get comfortable with a couple of software programs. Um, Aperture Photometry Tool, which I'm going to talk about, and Excel or LibreOffice, and really trend lines and creating them. Um, so this you got to go through just before you start taking any images. Uh, and again, APT, Astro Astronomical Photometry uh, tool, it's going to create the tables of magnitudes and signal to noise ratios. And Excel you use to create the graphs uh, and draw the trend lines. So data acquisition kind of talked a little bit about this. Uh, you want to try and pick an excellent night, good seeing, no moon in the sky. Uh, target area should be near the zenith to minimize atmospheric extinction. Uh, target area will ideally contain only a few stars. Uh, you don't really want any nebulosity or anything in there. Uh, a few faint galaxies is okay. And, you know, ideally the target area will transit overhead in the middle of the data acquisition. Uh, you don't really need to be that precise about it, but again, it's to minimize this atmospheric extinction. Uh, so, what you do, what I did is take a series of images uh, of your chosen sublength uh, so that each image has the same total exposure time. I kind of talked about that. So, you know, for my stuff, I did 150 subs at two seconds. And I call that my two second series, uh, you know, and then down to, you know, 10 subs at 30 seconds. Uh, I call that my 30 second series. The, the ones that I'm going to be working on tonight is this, my 10 second series, uh, just for demonstration purposes. But this is all the images that I took of the same region of the sky. Uh, so I got a lot of images here to deal with. And, you know, what you do after you take your images, you calibrate them, just bias, dark, and flat, and then you stack them. Uh, and for each series, uh, you want about 10 data points at least. Uh, when I did this, actually, I, I went a little overboard. I created 15, and, and I'll show you what I mean when we get there. Um, but for example, uh, total time uh, of, of my exposures were 300 seconds in all cases. And I want about 10 data points 
uh, for each of those uh, series. So 300 divided by 10 means I, I want to stack my images so I get about 30 seconds, uh, 30 second intervals for each stacked image. So that's going to give me uh, total exposure times of 30, 60, 90, 120 seconds, 150 seconds, et cetera, up to 300 seconds. So now I have 10 images to measure uh, for the 10 second series. Uh, and you want to do an average combine because okay, we're going to be doing photometry. That's important. So uh, here's an example uh, of the three images you can see here. Here on the left is uh, three images at 10 seconds, 15 at, in the middle, 15 at 10, and then 30 at 10 over on the right. And I don't know if you can see, hopefully you can see that, that some of the fainter objects uh, start to appear in this image, and then they're a little bit better in this image. Uh, so you're starting to get, you know, better signal to noise of all these fainter objects here. This is, you know, fairly typical. You're all probably aware of this. Um, so on to some photometry and data analysis. Um, I guess, are there any questions so far about any other anything? I don't see any new questions. OK. Um, this program, Aperture Photometry Tool, it's free. Um, and it does a lot of stuff. Um, one of the first things you need to do when you open it up, uh, and pretty much whenever you do photometry of anything, uh, you need to figure out you know, what your aperture selection is going to be, the, the diameter uh, of the little circle you're going to be putting on top of stars, and then the annulus around that to measure the sky background. Um, you know, I found it works best to load the longest exposure in uh, and get your aperture size from that, and use that same size for all the uh, all the other images. And again, I work I walk through this in, in one of those screencasts. So you load your stacked image one at a time and create something called a source list. Uh, and aperture photography tool. And the source list contains uh, the magnitude, source intensity, and source uncertain uncertainty, which we're going to use to calculate the signal to noise ratio. There's also a lot of other stuff in there uh, that we're not going to worry about. Really, it's just those three things uh, that the program creates. It creates a nice table of all the stars that it finds and those quantities for those. Uh, and then you save the source list, which is a CSV file. Um, and well, you need to enter your CCD gain uh, into APT before creating this. That's necessary for the signal to noise ratio numbers to work. Um, here's a sample of the source list. Uh, and I'm sorry about the size of this. Actually, I chopped out about 15 columns uh, that was in there already. And I don't even know if you could see any of these headers, uh, but there's a lot of stuff in here uh, that, that this program creates, uh, too much stuff really, uh, for our purposes. Um, but we're going to concentrate on just those three columns uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so before we do that, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about this magnitude zero point. Um, if you've done photometry, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you haven't done photometry, uh, magnitude, the magnitude zero point, it's, it's a calibration number. Um, and it's a number that needs to be added to the instrumental magnitude, which is what you measure, uh, to convert it to a standard magnitude. Okay, so for example, uh, if a star's instrumental magnitude comes out as minus 10, for example, uh, and the standard magnitude is plus 15 that you get from a star catalog, so that's like the V-band magnitude of the star, then magnitude at mag zero is plus 25 in this case. Okay, that's, that's just, it's a calibration number to convert from instrumental to a, a kind of a real magnitude. Uh, 
And you need to calculate this mag zero for each subframe that you measure. So there's a lot of work right there. Um, not really. Uh, and actually, it should be similar for each series. So, for example, all the stacked 10 second images uh, should have nearly the same mag zero. And here's that same image again. And you can see that the, uh, the, the 30 second image has a mag zero of 26.65. And the other two mag zeros are, are uh, almost identical to with a hundredth of a magnitude. Um, that's a good thing. So there are several software programs that can calculate mag zero. Uh, the uh, APT program can do it. It's more tedious. Uh, there are several steps involved. It's much more time consuming. It works. Uh, and I refer you to uh, the online document or the documentation if you want to go that route. Um, program I use is called Astrometrica. Uh, that's the program I use for doing astrometry, but it also does a calibration of images where it goes out and identifies stars. It, just, it does a plate solve, essentially, uh, but it also calculates a magnitude zero for the image. It does a little photometry on it. Um, once you get it set up correctly, uh, you can drop 10 images in there all at once, process them to a plate solve all at once, and it will spit out a magnitude zero for all 10 of those images within a few seconds. Uh, then you convert those instrumental magnitudes. Uh, you, need to, you need somewhere to convert instrumental to standard magnitudes. Uh, you can do it in Excel. Uh, you can also do it in uh, APT if you want. Um, so that's enough about magnitude zero. It's, it's a calibration number that you really need to do. Um, okay, so I think we've kind of talked about this, but um, you know, basically what I'm what I'm saying here is that you take each one of your um, images, you process them in APT, you get a table. Uh, containing magnitudes and uh, something that we're going to use to calculate a, a, a SNR uh, for maybe 10 to 100 stars in, in each image that you're processing. Uh, then you take these source lists, uh, 10 in this case, on, and you import them into Excel and you start working on it. Uh, the, probably the last bullet here is the most important. Uh, you will end up with a lot of data. Uh, so switching from uh, APT to Excel, uh, there are really, like I said, only three columns in the source list that you're interested in. The magnitude, source intensity, and source uncertainty. Uh, you can forget about all the other stuff in there. Um, and the first thing I do is create a new column for the signal to noise ratio. And simply the signal to noise ratio is equal to the source intensity divided by the source uncertainty. Um, and create a new column for standard magnitude, which is just the instrumental magnitude plus uh, magnitude zero. And I have, a, I have an example here showing you um, kind of an e excerpt from uh, what, what uh, APT spits out. Here's source intensity, source uncertainty, and magnitude. Here are the two columns that I've added, uh, the signal to noise ratio and the standard magnitude. Uh, and, you know, if you look at this stuff, there's some weird numbers in here. Uh, you know, really low signal to noise ratios. Um, Aperture Photometry tool does a good job, but it's not perfect. Uh, so it will identify things as stars that aren't stars. Depending on how you have certain parameters set up, uh, you can kind of tweak it so that it's real sensitive, or you can tweak it so that it, it isn't so sensitive. Uh, I had this kind of set up so that it was probably a little too sensitive, uh, but 
you can go through this and filter that stuff out. Um, these these kind of outliers that you see here. Um, and I, I kind of go through that on the screencast. So uh, don't be afraid of, of seeing some kind of really weird numbers in here. Um, you know, I'm sure I didn't image a 22.8 magnitude star. I, I am sure of that. Um, so, uh, for each source list, uh, we want to create a graph. We want to create a graph of magnitude voice versus signal to noise ratio. Let me back up. So we're going to create a graph using this column and this column here, just those two columns. Uh, and then we're going to fit a trend line through that data, hopefully, uh, and get the equation for that trend line. Um, and the equation, it's going to be a logarithmic equation uh, of this form down here. So here's an example. Uh, I have two uh, data sets here. This is a, essentially a 30 second uh, exposure, three at 10. And over here is my 300 second exposure, 30 at 10. And here's the magnitude over here and signal to noise ratio down here. You probably can't see the numbers. Um, this equation is what we're after. Uh, and the correlation coefficient is good to see one uh, that high. And I'll point out here, you know, I have a, a signal to noise ratio of 10 highlighted here. So this is kind of, you know, we, the cutoff of being able to do photometry. And you can see for my 30 second exposure, you know, I can get down to maybe 17.5 magnitude, something like that. Uh, here's 17 and 18. However, for a 300 second exposure, signal to noise ratio of 10 is going to get me down to maybe 18 and a half magnitude, whole magnitude fainter. Um, that's good to know, but this isn't the graph we're shooting for at the end. We wanted these two equations here, uh, and the other, in my case, the other uh, 13. So, you know, for each series, you, you go through that and create a graph, and you get these equations. And here are all my equations. Uh, I'm sorry about throwing all these equations at you, um, but they're not really nasty difficult equation. It's just a simple logarithmic equation. Um, you can see they're very similar, uh, but you know this would be for my, uh, actually in my case, this is a 20 second, this is 40, 60, 80, 100, down here to 300. Because uh, I did 15, even though it says use the 10 formulas here, I really should say 15. Um, so now we're ready to really uh, get into this. Um, before that, how are we doing on questions? Uh, one question did pop up. I didn't want to interrupt you, but uh, we might be past the point when you would normally speak about it. Do you use master darks or make dark and subs for every sub exposure time used? And I guess maybe, I don't know if you had gone into your calibration but maybe just give us a general overview of calibration requirements for uh, sure. your type of imaging. Sure. Um, it, it's just like you were going to do a regular astrophotography. Um, you know, for my example, I, I took uh, 30 10 second um, exposures, and I processed each of those 10 second exposures with calibration. So I did a bias correction. Uh, I, did, I did a, a dark subtraction for a, a, you know from a li library of, of darks that I have for 10 seconds, um, and I did a flat field correction. So you you calibrate all the raw data just like you normally would uh, before you stack them. You don't do any more calibration after uh, after you you do the first calibration. So if, you know, for my 30-second uh, series, you know, I calibrated the same uh, bias and flat and used a 30-second dark for those. Does that 
that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, another, Alex just asked a question. Uh, to characterize your system, characterize your sky, how much time do you take to acquire the data? How much time to commute, compute the data? Uh, well, uh, I live uh, about, my observatory is about nine miles from downtown Cincinnati. Uh, I've got a C14 uh, and, a, and a camera with a Sony uh, uh, 694 chip in it. Um, and, you know, I got a fair amount of light pollution. Um, the total time you spend collecting data, you know, it's basically however many sub-exposures you're going to take. You know, in my case, I did 150 at two seconds, uh, and I can't remember, you know, the rest. I did I did 30 at 10, um, all those combinations up to 300 seconds. So you basically add up all that time plus about four seconds to read, you know, three or four seconds to read the, the camera, and that's the data acquisition time. Uh, most of the time, I said, was in, was at Excel. You know, I probably, because I did so many sets, I did a two-second series, a five, a 20, a 30, uh, a 10, uh, and a 60. Um, you know, that's a lot of charts and a lot of formulas. Uh, so I probably spent... Um, total of maybe six or seven or eight hours total in Excel uh, and maybe a couple of hours in uh, doing the photometry with APT. Um, that's, that's a rough ballpark. So the, the aqu data acquisition time is minuscule compared to you know, all the other stuff. Um, I'll ask a question too. Uh have you used a system, or have you used an optical tube besides your C14? No. No, because that's a light bucket, so that is probably, for what you're doing, one of the best systems, um, or at least one of the best, I don't want to say reasonably priced systems, but uh, kind of readily off-the-shelf available systems for uh, having large aperture and not being tens of thousands of dollars. Yes. Yes, that was uh, that was definitely a factor when I um, went to purchase it. Um, you know, my big problem is light pollution. Right. As, you know, as it is for so many. Um, so let's see, anything else more on this? So, so I get these, you know, 10 equations. What are we going to do with these things? Well, uh, this is where um, the presentation could really blow up on me, uh, and, or I, I can really do a good job. Uh, so it's going to be either a kind of a home run or uh, a, an explosion. Um, and what, what I've done here, <clears throat> you want to create this table. Uh, in, in a spreadsheet program. And I started by creating uh, a column here going from 1 to 10. These are going to be my signal to noise ratios. And going across here are my exposure times, OK? 20, 40, 60, 80, up to 300. And again, I'm, I'm using this 10-second series as kind of a model. Uh, so, so far, so good, I hope. Um, then for each column, I'm going to use one of these equations back here to fill in the numbers for that column. So for this 20-second total exposure time, this is two subs at 10 seconds each. Uh, that's my first column. I grab this equation right here and plug it into this cell, and the variable x is really the signal-to-noise ratio, okay? Because this 
is a formula that relates uh, magnitude to signal to noise ratio. So that first formula goes here. And then I go down and fill the rest of this column with that same formula. Uh, and here's my variable x over here. Okay, and I do the same for uh, my 40 second. Uh, here's, you know, my eight subs at 10 seconds each. So this is a total of 80 second. The equation for the 80 second goes in here. And I just go all the way across. Um, finally, to my, my 30 at 10 second uh, stacked image. And that equation, this last one down here, goes in this first column, and I just fill the rest of them down below it. Uh, and there's a quick and easy way to do that in Excel or most spreadsheet programs, um, which I go through in the, in the little screencast that I did. So this is the big table that we are hoping to get. Um, is that OK, Adam? Did you follow me? Yeah, I did. Okay. Yep. Good. Uh, if you didn't follow me and you're out there, just you know, uh, ask a question. I'll see if I can do a better job. So after we get this big table, uh, which takes a little time to create. Uh, now we can go in and start creating graphs of uh, exposure time versus magnitude, which is really where we want to go. So what you do when you create a graph is, uh, you know, up here is your x-axis of time, 20, 40, 60, 300 seconds. And if you want to create a graph of um, a signal to noise ratio of 5, you grab this um, row of numbers, and you put them in a graph. And here we are back to that uh, first graph that I showed you. Um, so that would represent, let me go back, this, this SNR of 5 for my 10-second series, that is this blue line up here. Okay? And when you think about it, each one of these data points comes from a different equation. Okay, so these 15 data points are really coming from 15 different equations. Uh, and the fact that they line up so nicely and they give me a correlation coefficient of 0.9929 uh, tells me at least that this is a, a kind of a valid process to do this. Um, otherwise, you know, if something was wrong, these, num these, these data points could be all over the place. Um, so you can come back and you can do the same for a SNR of 7 and SNR of 10. Uh, those are these plots here. Uh, so this is how we get to this graph. Um, And like I said at the beginning, if you have a different series, and you know, in my case, I did a 2 and a 5 and a 10, 20 and a uh, 30 and a 60. I did all that for these, uh, generated a lot of data. Uh, and I took the equations for the five second trend line, or the, the SNR of, of five uh, trend line for each one took this equation here and added them one at a time to this plot. Uh, so this is showing me, you know, for a SNR of 5, uh, this is, you know, where I need to be roughly to get a, get a 19th magnitude star, you know, somewhere down in here. And again, you know, Alex, uh, if, if you've got a bad night, then, you know, you may want to push it down here. It, it, this is, again, there's too many variables to get an exact number here. Uh, this is just a helpful guide that I, uh, I find useful. Uh, so we're almost done here. However, uh, oh, you can extend those trend lines out. Uh, you know, my data cut off here at, at 300 seconds, uh, but I feel pretty confident about extending this out because those correlation coefficients were so high. 
uh, you know, the, the trend line fit the data so well that, um, you know, I pushed it all the way out here to, to uh, 600 seconds, 10 minutes. Uh, and now for an SNR5, I'm starting to get down to 20th magnitude, which is about the limit that I can do on a really good night here. That's, that's kind of where I draw the line as to, you know, what I'm even going to attempt. Uh, anything fainter than 20th, maybe 20.2 or 3, uh, if I, you know, feel like giving it a try. Um, but that's where I max out. Um, now, one thing we didn't talk about are errors. Uh, there's a relationship between signal noise ratio and magnitude uncertainty. Uh, and that's a pretty simple relationship. One sigma of magnitude uncertainty is equal to 1.0857 over the signal to noise ratio. If, if you go look up uh, this relationship, you'll, you'll see that equation in several places. It's a, it's a straightforward linear one-to-one -one relationship. So technically, our SNR5 graph should look something like this. We have a magnitude uncertainty of plus or minus 0.22. Okay, this is more real. Uh, and when you look at this and say, well, you know, gee, what am I going to use to get a mag, you know, what, what exposure time am I going to use here? Um, you can really see that this is a, a ballpark process. Uh, and actually, I feel this is probably as good a process as you can do, uh, at least that I can do. Um, this is, you know, the width of these lines is showing a plus or minus of about 0.22 magnitudes. Um, now, if you want to shoot for a higher SNR of 10, well, the width of those lines gets a lot less, uh, plus or minus about a tenth of a magnitude. Uh, and you can see that things have shifted down as well. Let me go back. This is the same scale, uh, back and forth. You can see how, you know, the SNR of 10 is shifted down. Uh, so there's no way I'm going to be getting a, a 20th magnitude object uh, with an SNR of 10, not, not from my location with my equipment. Um, however, for astrometry of asteroids, uh, an SNR of five is is good enough to get a position of it, uh, assuming you get a nice sharp point uh, on the image. Um, I have found SNR of five to be to be sufficient. Um, so the the error part is something that you know you need to be aware of when you're calculating exposure time based on these graphs. Uh, and some final thoughts. Well, we've said absolutely nothing about atmospheric extinction, uh, except maybe in the very beginning. Uh, and atmospheric extinction is definitely something that you need to think about. Uh, you know, imaging a, a 19th magnitude star straight overhead uh, and getting a signal to noise ratio of uh, 10 is, is not the same as trying to image a 19th magnitude star uh, at an altitude of 20 degrees or 30 degrees and getting a signal to noise ratio of 10. Um, obviously, you know, there, there's a big difference as you get lower in the sky. Um, and I refer you to a good article uh, in Sky and Telescope. Uh, I have a link here at the end of that where you can calculate, a, get a pretty good estimate of what the atmospheric extinction is uh, for your location. It, it really does a good job. There's an Excel spreadsheet that you can download. Uh, but, you know, you, you can end up adding a magnitude and a half uh, to some of those numbers. So, you know, what was a 19th magnitude object now becomes a, you know, 20.5 magnitude object and it can make a big difference. Uh, technically, this is, you know, this process is for V-band magnitude since the mag zero uh, that we calculated using, uh, is, that I used, uh, calculating, calculating mag zero using Astrometrica uh, is, a, is using a VMAG 
uh, catalog. If you use other filters, uh, then you need to use a MAG0 based on that system. Um, and this probably won't work, uh, probably not at all, for narrowband filters, which I know uh, Casper imagers use quite a bit of. Um, I don't know of any way really of, of doing that because I don't know of any photometric catalogs using narrowband filters. If, if they exist, uh, I would be interested to know about them. Uh, maybe somebody out there can answer that question. Uh, and then some finally some links um, that you might find helpful. Um, I think that's it. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so here's what's running through my mind, and, and you said it right at the beginning of the uh, the session, and maybe Alex, when uh, when he uh, asked you exactly what this is for, um, it kind of I, I see what you're saying. So you are doing uh, astrometry, you know the magnitude of the object you want to image, and this gives you a guideline to not waste your time. Say, I probably need 300 seconds of exposure to get a good enough SNR on this, right? Yes, exactly. So we're doing pretty picture photography, or, or a lot of us are doing pretty picture photography. And if we want to apply this to pretty picture photography, basically, it seems to me like the process is the same. And, and I'll, I'm going to qualify that first by pointing out something that I've heard and never quite liked. And that is that point sources behave differently than extended objects. Or, or maybe I'm phrasing that in a way that, that's a little bit more favorable to my opinion. Because I've heard, um, I've heard point, sur point sources behave differently than extended objects. But it doesn't quite, I, I don't know what exactly it is about the light from point sources that behaves differently than extended objects. What I think becomes the main factor in that is that the magnitudes of extended objects are very poorly defined. Yes. Uh, probably more so due to the fact that they're extended objects. Exactly. What, what's the magnitude of a galaxy? Well, what part of the galaxy? If you're talking about the core, well, yeah, basically all of us can resolve the core of a galaxy in 20 minutes. But if you're trying to hit that outer limb of the spiral arms of something, then it, it's something different. But I think if, if one were to, for their own sake, even if they were to kind of arbitrarily come up with the figures, better define the part of the galaxy that they're trying to image, they would be able to apply basically everything you, you presented. Um, you have to be able to, that, that's the one thing that I think is difficult. And I think it, for extended objects, the signal to noise ratio may be the most telling um, factor you can use uh, because you cannot calculate what the zero magnitude or, or the, uh, the zero mag of an extended object, right? Because you just don't know. Well, yeah. Um, the the, and I looked into this, and I tried to find a way to tie this into uh, extended objects. Um, and I started going down the road of surface brightness. Uh, right. How many magnitudes per square arc second is this little piece of the nebulosity compared to how many magnitudes per arc second uh, of the sky background right next to it? Uh, and trying to figure out, you know, okay, well then, what's a signal to noise? What's a good signal to noise ratio uh, in order to get this little faint piece of nebulosity out here next to the background sky? Uh, you know, looking at surface brightness, and I didn't get very far down that road. Um, that would be a good project, uh, I think. Um, but yeah, the other thing is, you know, when you say the ring nebula is, you know, ninth magnitude. Well, okay, so that's if you took all the light from the ring nebula, condensed it down to a, a point source, right. uh, then it's effectively a ninth magnitude star. Um, but that doesn't really, you know, fit in too well to, okay, how long of an exposure do I need? Right. Uh, and, you know, extended objects are, are difficult, but 
uh, and I started seeing galaxies, you know, places where they would draw a contour for a, a certain magnitude per square, arc, a certain surface brightness, you know, saying that the, you know, the, the X contour at this surface brightness is so far away from the nucleus of a galaxy. Uh, but, you know, if you want to try and use this for imaging something like, you know, the Ring Nebula or M13, where, you know, you've got a, a ninth magnitude nebula or a fifth magnitude globular cluster, uh, and just see where it falls on the chart, uh, you know, give it a try. Um, but, you know, you're absolutely right. And the magnitudes for extended objects are kind of all over the place. And, you know, I wish there was a good way to tie this in. There may be some way to do it with, with looking at surface brightness. Mm -hmm. But it does appear, um, just based on your, uh, your charts, um, the, the, how do I say it? Uh, the steps to getting to deeper magnitudes, the, the uh, exposure times that get you to deeper magnitudes seem consistent with what I would expect of extended objects. So it, it doesn't seem like those, uh, it's, it's necessarily something about the light of point source objects that's behaving differently. It seems like the light's all behaving the same. And it's just uh, the way we define that, uh, that extended object would be the key. Um, well, the, the, yeah, the, the point source thing I think is that, you know, through no atmosphere, uh, a point source, no matter how much magnification you throw at it, it's still a perfectly tiny point source. Um, extended objects, as you magnify them, you start spreading the light out, mm -hmm. uh, and they become diff difficult to observe visually, uh, and that's because of, of the contrast uh, with the background sky. Uh, it, it, you don't get a stronger contrast. Um, so th when you try and image them, uh, the, the extended objects, um, they do behave a little differently uh, mm -hmm. than point sources. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess, okay, so if you're, uh, how does it work? If you, uh, if your aperture increases, but your F ratio stays the same, the star appears smaller, right? Yes. The bigger right. your scope, the smaller the star should appear. Right. So, uh, and, and yeah, I think, so that, I think yeah. the exposure time is more of an F number issue for extended objects mm -hmm. uh, than it is uh, an aperture diameter issue. Right, right. Yes, yes. Um, Whereas for stars, uh, it's not necessarily an F number issue. It's, it's the aperture diameter. Right. I think that's. I'm wondering then uh, if the reason it's an F ratio issue for, for extended objects uh, has to do with basically the read noise on the camera, right? Uh, because um, you have to get the you have to get the signal beyond the read noise of the camera to make it visible, right? Yes. So, um, I don't know, that's, I have to kind of think that through. I'm not, even yeah. sure, I'm not even sure what my question is right there, but uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, because your F ratio stays the same, but you get bigger scope, you're not necessarily, oh no, if your F ratio, you're getting more magnification then. You have to think that through. But, but either way, when I'm when I'm thinking like this after a presentation, it's definitely a good presentation. Thank um, you. No, no problem. Thank you for presenting. Um, any other uh, any other uh, questions for Basil before we uh, end this thing? Uh, anyone in the room or outside of the room? Uh, is there a Benefit to doing this exercise at new moon, quarter moon, half moon, three quarter, full moon, 
uh, to characterize your site? Um, I would suggest picking a night with no moon in the sky uh, to start with at least. Uh, and kind of your best case scenario, uh, the best night you can, you can pick. Uh, and that way, that gives you an idea of kind of the absolute, that, that sets a lower bar on your exposure time saying, well, I, I got to go at least this long on my best night to get this faint. You know, if there's, moon in the, if there's a moon in the sky, if there's haze, then you got to go longer. Now, if you want to, you know, maybe bracket it and do one on a good night with no moon and do it on a fairly typical night with a full moon, um, you know, you can kind of bracket these numbers and say, well, it's somewhere in between, a, you know, a good night with no moon and, a, you know, a typical night with a full moon. Yeah, I, I would think that if... What you're trying to do is know by the seat of your pants just about how far you've got to go in exposure time. Um, if you only do it once, you might know that I need to do more or less uh, for, for another night. But if you've done it on this particular night and then you have experience on another night and ex experience on another night, you might find out that in fact it's not linear. You know, with a quarter moon, I'm gonna have to do one thing. Yep. But with a, you know, it might be, so if you do it on two or three or four different nights, different situations, winter uh, clarity versus that summer haze that sometimes befalls us, yes. um, yeah, you might, you might get a whole lot more experience. But I should think that depending on what you're doing, you're probably going to, just by doing your photometry work, in your case, your pretty picture is in, our, in other people's cases, they're probably going to get that seat of the pants without ever having to go to the Excel spreadsheet in the first place. I, I find that I kind of get that way. Yeah, I, I, I do. Uh, say, okay, I want to get this 19.6 magnitude object. Well, that means I got to go, you know, at least 600 seconds. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the thing is, um, it takes a little bit, it takes a lot of time. It took me a lot of time to get through all that Excel stuff, uh, plotting those graphs and copying, pasting those equations. Uh, and, you know, the thought of doing that, you know, for five different phases of the moon, uh, I just, yeah. <laughs> it would be good to do, but will I ever do it? Yeah, maybe. Uh, uh, Basil, just asking, uh, do you choose a target and wait for it to get to the sweet spot, or do you choose something that's basically in the sweet spot or approaching the sweet spot as you're imaging? For the... Uh, I'm guessing for your astrometry. Or no, I'm guessing for this characterization, I should say. For, for when I took the uh, images that I measured, mm -hmm. um, you know, I just took a random part of the sky. It, it was a really good night. And I thought, well, you know, let's try this. Uh, so I just pointed the telescope about uh, an hour uh, east of the meridian, straight overhead, and just took my images of, you know, I kind of looked on the chart saying, okay, there's no nebulas or anything. You know, there are a few galaxies, uh, but I just wanted a blank star field. Now, I got a pretty tiny field of view with my setup, uh, you know, maybe about 15 arc minutes uh, along the big dimension. Now, if you're using, you know, a, a, a larger field of view where you're talking, you know, four or five degrees, um, you may want to, you know, center in on just the central part of that image to do this. Otherwise, you may be looking at, you know, five or six hundred stars that, that are going to be identified uh, when you do the photometry, and you really don't need that many. Uh, it may it may slow your system down. Um, do you tend to solve the images to get your magnitudes, or do you do a lot of that manually? Um, the when I you need to uh, calibrate the images uh, that you've stacked, and I use the program Astrometrica. To do that because Astrometrica will do a plate solve on that image and it will go out and grab uh, magnitudes from whatever catalog. There's about five or six different catalogs you could pick. 
Uh, I picked one that gives VMAG uh, magnitudes, and it looks at the stars that it's identified and is using as uh, astrometric calibration stars. Uh, and it also picks a set that it uses for photometric calibration stars. Uh, and it does all of the calculation, uh, and it gives you an average uh, magnitude zero for that particular image. That works really fast, uh, and you know, I find it, it, it's, it was the easiest way to get a magnitude zero for all those images. So with some um, fancy Excel work, you, you might be able to basically set up the spreadsheet once and uh, then drop the, the data right in there, right? Or do you set up the spreadsheet every time? Um, when I go through the actual process in Excel um, and I, I bring in the, uh, the data, uh, the source list from uh, aperture photometry tool and you get you're looking at this you know list of 800 stars uh, that are coming from 15 different stacked images um, you can filter some of that stuff out uh, there, there are some outliers in there that clearly don't belong uh, and when I go to plotting the uh, magnitude versus signal to noise ratio which is that first set. That's where you start to get those equations. Um, I basically just use a filter to isolate each image one at a time based on their file name. Uh, and so I go in and, and say, okay, I just want to look at the data from this file name, which corresponds to my 22nd stacked image, uh, and plot that data on, on a chart. Um, and then I go back and change the filter to a different file name, my, my image from uh, 40 seconds, uh, and I go back to that same chart, uh, and it just it updates the chart automatically, uh, so I get a different equation. So I don't have to go drawing, you know, 15 different charts plotting 15 different trend lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope I, I explained that, but it, I think when, when I actually go through it on, the, on one of the screencasts, uh, it's pretty obvious how, how it works uh, once you get it going. But it is a lot of Excel work or uh, LibreOffice spreadsheet work. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Oh, Adam, it's worth it. Adam, um, I, I was over uh, checking the YouTube uh, um, feed, the actual YouTube feed rather than our um, website feed. Um, I want to remind everybody that you're welcome to post comments over there, but there's no guarantee that anybody's going to actually be looking at them. And there may be two or three people over there. Um, we did have somebody, John Gubera, asked if uh, we knew about the Dragonfly Array. And uh, I asked him what he needed to know about him. I haven't heard back from him, so he may have disappeared since then. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, just Google Dragonfly Array, you'll find a whole bunch of things. It's basically a guy who's got a whole bunch of beautiful canon lenses and everything all attached and what is he up to 24 48 96 of them or something like that and he's taking a wide field survey of the sky but i just wanted to remind you that uh, everybody out there that if you if you are on youtube watching this and it's live well you're missing out on one of the reasons we go to the to this whole hangout procedure you can go on over to our website the astroimagingchannel.com and ask your questions live and, and we're seeing them we're monitoring them over there we're paying attention to them and trying to answer them for you and we'll do the best we can on in the other sites when we catch them but we can't promise that we're actually going to be paying attention over there you know there's only so many little windows you can have popped up on your computer here okay yep and i joked earlier that our chat is very feature rich but it actually is for a lot of people in the chat i don't know how many people have used this but you can share images you can actually have individual personal video chats, so it's. Uh, can you share your screen of that um, uh, of the chat? I, uh, Adam? I can. Let's see here. All right. Uh, let me. I'm going to do that so you don't see the infinite window. Um, oh no, that won't work, will it? Uh, there you go. 
uh, you're going to see the infinite window. Over here on the left side, or excuse me, on the right side, uh, you see the chat. And uh, you can see all the people in the room. You just type in your messages. Um, and let's say I see Alex in here. I could Hi. give Alex a personal video call. I could uh, give him an audio call. Let's see what else I could do. Oh, I could ban him. I could block him. There we go. Um, <laughs> yeah, like you'd be the first. <laughs> but, uh, but but more, most importantly is that we can't monitor all the chats and all the comments. This is kind of the one place we monitor and uh, get some decent conversations going. Um, and, of course, that's right on the bottom right of our website, theastroimagingchannel.com. So that's where to check it out. And don't worry, I will remind you next week and the week after and the week after because uh, we like having good conversations. Um, but again, thank you, Basil. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, I uh, have someone to present next week. I do not have his uh, title yet, but I think I'm going to be getting it in about a minute. Uh, so thanks for coming, and we'll see you all next week. Good night.